Taylor Hurd from Hackaday. Today we're back in the garage doing custom fiberglass. Well, what's custom fiberglass? Well, it's a way to make a mess, let me tell you. Um, and it's a permanent mess. It's a great mess. So, no, I, it's, it, when I work on my own cars or sometimes just need something done, I'll go and make a speaker pod or a subwoofer enclosure. You've seen them probably in custom cars. I just happen to like to do my own. I'm going to show you how to do a simple one today. A couple of quick examples, and I'm not saying I do the best in the world. I tend to get bored long before the job's done, but this is a subwoofer panel in my, a custom one I did in my 280Z as part of uh, a whole stereo build out I'm doing. And here's a custom pod I did uh, on one of my other cars where I was actually trying to also hide the hole from another speaker. So it's got kind of a strange shape, but it happens to fit snugly when the door shuts right in the uh, dashboard. And actually I did also some custom dyeing to make kind of the silver and black work. So, but this is a, a vinyl wrapped custom pod. We won't be vinyl wrapping today, but it's the last step in, uh, of doing what we do and it's something you can do yourself. So as I said, I'm going to show a small fake, well, we're going to do a one-off of a speaker pod, so it won't be stereo, so I won't have a use for it, other than to show you how to make them. And then I'm also going to show a regular old fiberglass mat, like you might be used to thinking with marine or Corvette bodies. Uh, but it's also how we do, um, we, we turn like your spare tire well into a whole base speaker tub. I went through that phase where I drove around without a spare tire, and I got burned by it once, so uh, spare tire is back in the car. Now, here's a... Uh, a throwaway pod I did earlier, that, uh, it was a couple years ago now, uh, I was playing actually with the angles to see what fit the car and everything, and actually uh, what the speaker could fit. And if you see the detail, there's an offset ring in there that allows the speaker to drop down in. All right. And I do that with a router, and we're not going to talk fully about routers, I'm going to, well I'll talk about them, I'm not going to turn my router on today. Uh, it's just too hot and dusty in here already. Uh, temperature here in New Jersey uh, went from 65 to 95 this week. So the thing about speaker pods when we make them, what we're really trying to do is starting with a backboard that, or, or something thinner than this, but this is what I'm using. Uh, we want to mount the speaker ring, the thing that will hold the speaker at whatever angle we want, whatever cool design we want. In fact, you, you know, you could do two of these and this would represent your, your uh, custom speaker pod. This happens to be MDF, multi-dense, medium density fiberboard. Um, it's okay, you get it wet, it sandwiches way up. Uh, but it is actually a lot nicer for routing and stuff than uh, uh, plywood and some of the other boards. So I use a lot of MDF when I do this. So let's say this is what I want my speaker pod to look like, where the rings represent the speaker. By the way, these are MDF rings. You guys can buy them pre-made. I use a lot of pre-made ones, but then I make rings from them, so I use them more as templates because ultimately I screw them up and I have to buy more. Uh, you can cut them out with uh, circle cutters using your router. Again, there's the router. You can do it with a jigsaw. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be using a jigsaw today. But I'm using these pre-cut rings to represent the speakers. and. This is my template I'm going to trace onto a backboard of MDF uh, to mount my speakers to. Alright, so there I've got my bottom of my speaker pod. I'm going to take it to the sander, which I actually keep in my blacksmith shop. But this will be, whoops. But this will be what our speaker pod uh, looks like when we're done. We'll have speakers raised above it. All right, so I've got my outline of my speaker pod. I'm going to uh, uh, take this out to the sander and, and smooth it off. But combined with the rings held off the ground, I'm going to, or held off the board, I'm going to show you how to do that. This will be what our speaker pod looks like, our custom pod. All right, sand it down. Before I do the next step, which is to put holes in here so we can wire up the speakers and everything once it's in, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about router because I'm going to use a hole saw to do this but I could use a router. What is a router? What, am I, what do I keep talking about? So let me show you that. So here's a small router table. I don't use it on my bench like this. Um, makes too much sawdust, so I use it uh, over in a different part of my garage. Uh, but let me show you a close-up of the uh, business end of this thing. So here in the center, we've got a big motor down below, and what we are doing, there we go, 
is we've got various rotating bits. And these are nasty looking things. These will these will hurt you big time, okay? So here's, here's a, a ring, it's two rings that I've stapled and glued together and it's got a shelf in here for a speaker. And I was able to do that with this particular um, router bit. The ball bearing tracks the inside and this removes the material to make a shelf. So I think that's called the rabbiting one. It's been too long since I actually had the names. This one here would do the opposite. It would make a, uh, it would cut in this far to whatever you're tracking and there are the templates on the top just like in that but it's a different you know here the ball bearing is bigger than the cutter here the ball bearing is smaller than the cutter and then here's one where the cutter and the ball bearing are the same size and this is where you punch a hole and trace something out directly so I could use this to make the hole in the bottom of the pod uh, but a lot of noise and sawdust I'm just going to use a hole cutter today by the way, you can do some cool things, especially when you're like in the plexiglass and stuff. Let's see if you can see that bevel here. This is, I polished this myself and everything, but I cut this using this type of cutter. And I was able to uh, make a, a, uh, a beveled edge all the way around and then light this from the center and then put my amp on it. Okay, I've, I've got my holes cut. I've actually even uh, changed my headband. I was dripping all over everything here. It's extremely hot today. I wanted to show you what a big ring looks like, right? I, I have a whole bunch of these uh, that I just forgot about, so I thought I'd show you one. for This for obviously for the biggest of subwoofers, or for tracing the outline of one, but this actually has the, uh, the rim for, for a, a woofer mounting. So while I was doing this, something occurred to me. I was thinking of doing two rings, like two speakers, but one of the things we can do is I took the cutout from the small hole, let me reverse this, and I can do a flush mount tweeter pointed whatever direction I want. So I'm actually going to do that just to change it up a little. So we're going to do one ring and one flush mount. Now the fun begins. So we're going to make a frame of rings and standoffs to make a crazy shape for us. And then we're going to cover it with polyester fleece. This is stretchy stuff. In the old days we used grill cloth, which sucked. Quite honestly, it didn't stretch, uh, it, it took, took a lot of strength, and then it never incorporated itself into the resin. So let's talk about resin, the fiberglass, what is it? I buy mine by the gallon, I get a new gallon every, every summer. Uh, there's at least one unopened gallon sitting around here somewhere. By the way, the way you dispose of fiberglass is you, you take all your hardener, pour it in there, shake it up real good, it turns into a lump of inert material and you can throw it away. But fiberglass has a limited date. Okay, it's good for like 90 days. You know, I use it past that, but uh, it's no, it's 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 got a lifetime, right? So a lot of these have born on dates. The I even went to my local marina or marine repair, I should say, and the the uh, the, the resin they had there not only was uh, ageless, so you couldn't tell, but you didn't know if it was the good stuff or not. The good stuff's supposed to be red. By the way, a lot of what I know is from listening to a guy named Robert Garza from Select Products. Uh, he was a fellow small business owner and he catered to like the home audio market and then he got bought by somebody now they only deal with distributors. So Robert, miss you guy. But uh, based on a lot of what he did in his videos, you know, he, he, he'll tell you that it should be red which indicates it's a prime uh, resin, polyester resin and if you get it green it means it's all the slop poured together. And it's not even guaranteed to set up, okay? So I get a fresh, I get mine from fiberglass site. So it's just easy to remember, I throw a sticker around somewhere. And when you get it, you get with it the hardener and you also get some surfacing wax to help it unstick from stuff. And I used to get my, the, the uh, hardener is, is uh, methyl ethyl ketone peroxide, MEKP. I actually used to get that by big jars. I just went and looked, or big, big containers. And, and the, over the years, the container cracked and vented out, right? So I'll be using the stuff they gave me. But polyester resin, you mix 1%, 1.5% of your hardener. And I use, this is old, but I imagine it's okay, but I'll still use the new stuff. This is uh, how I measure it out is I figure out the milliliters, or the, yeah, the milliliters of, of uh, resin I'm doing and then I, I measure myself a little bit by squeezing it into this upper cup and I pour it in. So I don't do it by the drops. Some people do it till it turns warm. 
it is an exothermic relationship, hey, big word, means it gets hot. And we actually have a chart that came with it for hardener percentage versus temperature, and it's actually hot enough, I'm going to look at it today just to see if I need to like be more closer to 1% than 1.5%. So the cool thing is um, when we use this fleece, it is polyester itself, and so in, in what, as Robert said from Select Products, it actually starts to dissolve in the polyester. So I'm going to stretch this on a frame and uh, we're going to fiberglass it up. So hang on a second. So the first thing I'm going to do is I am going to hot glue little pieces of MDF to act as little supporting struts for my ring. And hopefully I'll show you a close-up of this on the bench itself. But you say hot glue. Well, that's not very stable. Well, all we need is this ring to sit in the right position long enough for the polyester to harden, right? So, uh, hot glue. Okay, I've now got my three posts and again, they just have to be strong enough for the, the, to, to get this whole process kicked off. So I'll go ahead and, uh, and do the ring here. And I'm usually not happy until I have burned myself. So I'm not going to drop it in, but if that's, this is the ring where the speaker would go, and it's now pointed, in theory, towards the listeners. There it was. Just burned myself. And what I was trying to do, I just want to make sure that when I pull my fabric over this, I don't actually pick up a corner for, that I didn't mean to. I want this to be the edge, and this to be the edge, and all around here to be the edge that the fabric catches. Okay, a word about this fleece. Uh, I think my wife actually picked this up at Joann's. It's, it's just a polyester fleece. It does have directions. It stretches better, so I try and get that in the direction that's going to be the worst for me. There's a furry side and a not so furry side, so if you, you do want to uh, try and have the not so furry side up or you're going to spend a long more time uh, sanding. For the next step, I'm going to staple my fabric down to the frame while stretching it and I'm going to use an air powered stapler. Uh, you, you could use a regular stapler, you could use super glue. I keep a, a uh, one of those plastic jars of cyanoacrylate in three different speeds or densities um, and there's nothing wrong with doing that. I just prefer to use a stapler. So you can see it's starting to work where I'm pulling it tight and I'm actually doing the staples end to end. Okay, so here's what it looks like completely stapled out through the bottom. So you'll notice I got to cut this off and there is a row of staples that will actually um, can grind off when all this is done because it'll be fiberglass at that point or enough will have come around the edge. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a fresh razor blade and I'm going to trim off the bottom here and uh, as I said there's staples in here but we'll be actually able to grind those off later. Now mostly flat, uh, I'm going to do one more step where I kind of hit some of the missing spots. But I'm also going to staple in here to give the ring to tighten everything and also uh, start the process of creating the, the dropout where the speaker would go. Okay, you can see what I've done here. It's actually tight as a drum here and everything else is a little tighter. And I'm going to go ahead and cut this part out with a razor blade now. Remember this, we can either drill later for a tweeter or we can do a surface mount tweeter on it just to be a little different. And the bottom's pretty much clean. Again, we clean this up later, but we just want to lay flat while we're working on it. And there we are, ready for fiberglassing, finally. Couldn't wait, could you? Um, the cool part, the smelly part, the part that's cool because it's smelly. All right, I have boxes of these. Can't have enough of them. Go, if you go to Home Depot to get them, you're going to pay out the wash. You can get a box for 100 from 
online auto supply places. Uh, they'll pay for themselves the fourth time you do this, in my humble opinion. I'm going to, it's graduated, all kinds of mix ratios, everything on here. I'm going to go 400 milliliters uh, to cover this, and then I'm going to use, uh, it's between one and one and a half percent, well, four would be one percent, six would be one and a half, so I'm going to shoot for round five or so when I pour it, just to bracket it. All right. You should be wearing gloves for this. Only problem I have is I never know what to do with the, the there's always a finger it seems like it's not with the rest. Uh, a technique I learned for pouring resin is to pour from the top, have the, uh, have the outlet at the top. All right, like I said, I got a nice uh, reddish color here that, that usually denotes a higher quality polyester. Going to add my hardener, MEKP methyl ethyl ketone peroxide. If you remember your ketones, you stick a methyl and ethyl together with a C and a double bond O or something like that in the middle. That's where a lot of smells and stuff come from. This stuff smells great. Don't you be sniffing it. You should be wearing a mask. I'm old. My brain's gone, so I'm past the point. But save yourselves. So, I usually use a screwdriver for this. I can't find my stern screwdriver, so I'm going to use one of these. Again, my Home Depot got stingy with these, so I bought a big old box of these things. I give them out as party favors. So, and when we stir this, you're actually going to see a change in not just the color and the consistency, you're going to see it actually kind of whoop through it, and that's when it's starting to bond. It'll actually get a little clearer. Also, I do in this, I buy crap loads of cheap uh, paint brushes. Uh, you know, I might get 20 for $9 or $5 or something. So you throw them away when you're done. Now, if you can see this, the color has changed. It's no longer reddish pink. It's becoming clear with just a tint of a red overtone to it in the center. And we are going to soak the material so that it, it, there's no air left in the material. And you'll, you'll see what I mean. Now, usually I do this. On a desk I have just for this kind of thing, but I don't have a camera shot. What I'm really trying to do is use the paintbrush just to convey a mess of, of, of polyester of the resin to the material. You may, you may or may not be able to see what I'm doing, but you'll see me chase the light spots. It doesn't hurt to try and brush the fibers flat. Um, a little bit of less sanding for later, but at the end of the day, you're going to be doing lots of sanding anyways. I'm going to go ahead and make sure that the back side is fiber two where it comes, or uh, I'm sorry, coated two where it comes around the corner so that later when I sand it off, I'm sanding fiberglass flush. All right, it's coated. I'll show it to you better after it sets up. And actually, I do have a, a, a secret. One of the pegs did kind of let loose from all the pulling. I did have to get in there with some epoxy, and so it's a little deformed, and so at this point, I'm wanting the, the fiberglass to set up before I, I do a bunch of gyration with it. So I'll give this, uh, oh, I don't know, I'm going to um, give it half an hour and we'll come back and check on it. All right, here, here the fiberglass has set up. Oh, it may look the same, but all very solid. I got a nice good uh, set. There's no sticky spots on it. A uh, good way to tell if all of your resin set up is you get to make little abstract art. You can set that around, people pick that up, wonder what's going on. And you can reuse your container. So the next step is body putty. And it's, it's I, I use Rage Gold. You'll see this a lot used in uh, the audio magazines and stuff. <laughs> it's funny to see a can this small. I normally buy it by the gallon. I bought this just so I could do this thing today. And then also uh, metal glaze. Now, the body putty typically leaves pinholes. The metal glaze leaves smaller pinholes. They're still pinholes. Uh, with, you know, just little pockets. If you were to paint it, you'd see these little pockets. And so you end up wanting to use a high build primer. And, and trust me, when I do all this, I, uh, if I'm doing it for a real thing for my car, I actually use automotive spray paint. I've got the air hose with the dryer in it, and I've got big paint cans here and stuff. Um, another technique to do is to actually mix the body putty with resin 50-50. And I've, I've heard it called a lot of things. I call it goop, okay? Um, I'm not doing that today. I almost did, but I was just like, oh, the sanding time on it. 
When you sand down body putty uh, within an hour after it sets, it's a lot easier to work, actually 15 minutes. So I'm just going to give this a uh, coat of body putty, maybe mix in some, some metal glaze, we'll see how that goes, and then I'm going to sand this down, so give me a minute. So I've got my body putty on my board that is basically a tablet of paper attached to a, a, a board to hold it and this is actually kind of useful. They sell this auto body supply places on the web. You'll need a scraper. Yes, I have a box of scrapers. Home Depot doesn't even give them away. And the, the general uh, uh, accepted way to do in the harner is to leave a trail of hardener. This will find its own, well, I scooped it on the paper, this will find its own diameter due to viscosity and then the general thing is to leave a trail of the hardener across the diameter of it. Like so. And then, and I'm not as good at this as I should be. If you watch guys that do this for real, they do this motion. See we're actually going to go for a green color by the time the blue and everything mixes. They do it without mixing air into it. I get some air in it. All right, looks like crap, doesn't it? As a matter of fact, it's getting hot. Um, I, I'm taking some shortcuts, and I should have, I should have sanded that fiberglass first because I had to work my ass off just to get a covering on this. I'm going to sand almost all of this back off. Um, and there's just pits and holes just due to the nature of the way the rough fiberglass and the body putty came together. The mini start this way. I am not worried. With that said, this is not going to be a prize winner. I'm trying to just get through a video here. So I'm going to let this set up, but not too long. Um, it actually gets harder to work after an hour. It becomes cement. All right, that was a brutal sanding session. It's 90 degrees here in New Jersey again today, very humid. Uh, evidently my son used all of my reusable but yet disposable heptic filter, so I had to put, up, put on the bug as we used to say in the Army. Um, and I had to sand my ass off, as you can see here. Now my friends during this process were Rolox, right? These things. That particular one and then the green one, they'll, they'll take the skin right off your bone. It's only useful for knocking the corners down. You cannot sculpt with it. You need something else to sculpt with. I couldn't find my air-powered orbital sander, so I went to my electric one. Problem is, the, the, the pads are so old they were coming off the adhesive, or the adhesive's coming off the, uh, the pad, right? But I still got to this part, and then I was able to actually to even use one of these in my air tool to rough it in in here. There are pinholes all over this place, and I don't know that I care for what we're doing here. I might show you a trick I used to cheat where you can't see the holes as much, so I might go back in with my metal glaze. I might not, but I'm taking a break. All right, here we are another day. I've decided to do it right. Sleep is a good thing, right? If you look, there's a divot there, right? That's, that's bigger than a pinhole, but that's the same idea. There was an air hole in the body putty. And it's quite common when you start with the rough stuff. Um, and, and like I said, then you approach it with metal glaze or a mixture of metal glaze and body putty. I'm going to do a couple of these um, with the metal glaze so that you do see all the steps involved. The thing to notice here with the metal glaze is it's frontier, right? That's how we're going to fill the holes. That's, I don't know of any other properties, actually. We even use the same hardener. We use the same technique. I'm going to put hardener just across the, uh, the diameter of the pool it formed. And I just made the mistake, since it's been a couple days, I'm not really giving my hardener a good squishy squishy to mix it up. So, uh... <laughs> Oops. So where I'm going after some of these holes, trying to get a highlight there so you can see it. I'm just going ahead and I'm, I'm, I'm pushing this into the holes. Um, and I'll probably come back across with my little green thing to smooth it out. And I'm not going to do this whole thing. I'm going to cheat. Um, and I wanted to cheat and not even do this step, but here we are. And here you, you actually see the glaze, some of its advantage. 
Uh, this bends a little bit and so I can get a nice a nice cut going. Nice smooth. See it's already smoother. Let's get the light on it. Can't why my lights blew out too during the heat storm. Um, already smoother than the body putty. And it's already hard. <laughs> means I used a little too much. All that rainy stuff came out, used a little too much. Um, it also does harden fast, which means I can cycle fast. This will be set up. I can go to the sander. I'm actually going to show you my orbital sander next thing. Main reason is the temperatures drop below 95 degrees here, so we're happy. All right. Because of the dust, I'm doing this just outside my garage. Um, when I'm really doing this for real, I actually have an area I clean off, but I just didn't get to it. And I'm not going to make a dusty mess out of the area you saw. So here we are. The sun's going up and down. Forgive me. When I was sanding the really rough stuff, I used an air sander. Air hose goes here. And this stuff, which will take your fingers off if you, uh, <laughs> if you uh, get into it, right? Um, and then there's a green version of this that's even rougher. This is called a Rolock because of the little threaded thing and it just goes right on there and you swap those out as soon as you wear them out and that stuff wears even these things out. Okay, so the other kind of sander is this one's air powered also. This is an orbital sander, meaning it doesn't just spin and make uh, concentric grooves and cuts and burns in your, it, it kind of does a pattern. And I'm going to use my electric one and I'm going to show you, you, you can actually touch this while it's running because it's so smooth it's not actively going. There's there's uh, 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 planetary gears in here and stuff. And that does, huh? And you like to touch it. So I'm going to briefly smooth off the metal glaze you just saw me put on. Yes, I should have a mask on. So basically you saw me uh, using the very front of it as much as possible. I didn't have to worry about gouging and stuff due to the, uh, the nature of the sander. And let me show you the next thing we do. As I get closer to the final product, I start getting cleaner. I'm not going to wipe this down just yet, but uh, I'm going to give it a good dusting with air. And Normally I might even vacuum the inside out, but again, we're skipping steps here. My next step is to use some high build primer. I happen to use SEM for it. They make a whole line of automotive stuff, so I figure they know what they're doing. Usually I use one of these stuck to a, a can, but this has uh, a kind of nozzle. probably won't fit, but it's probably a better nozzle than normal. This, I put, you put that on a can, it makes it into a spray gun for you. I do have spray gun equipment and an air dryer and everything else. Maybe I'll show you that. So I don't usually rattle can all of this stuff, but uh, you certainly can. Some Half my stuff is rattle canned. All right, trick here on clean your can when you're done. Spray it till it's out of there. Um, I actually did get a little wet. I, I got aggressive as I came around a second time. Basically, you spray it, you let it dry, you spray it again, you, you try and overlap your spray, but a dusty spray is better, especially for high build primers because you want it to expand and land on this thing. The more you hit it with the air to try and clean it up, the more pinholes you see and you get in a cycle. Um, so when you do this for real, you'll, you'll lose lots of layers of something like a primer to finally give you your automotive finish if you're going that direction. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to use something that has texture to try and hide my pinholes and stuff. This is probably my favorite texture too. So let me show you that. First I am going to sand this. So with the high bill primer, that's usually by the time you get that stamped, you're hand sanding. And then we're going to go for a, uh, uh, a textured paint. So as you probably know with painting, clean, 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 right? If your paint flakes off, probably wasn't clean. And even though it looked clean. So I've, I've, you know, I have tack cloths, things like that. I'm just using a pre-painting prep. This one's from Eastwood. There's a lot of kinds you can use. I tend not to use as acetone on this, though I'm not afraid to either. But acetone melts too many things, so take that back. So it, since I don't have a, uh, a tack cloth with me, I got a box upstairs, uh, but it's way too hot to go get it. 
So I'm just going to spray it and wipe it with a microfiber cloth. All right, so normally, like I said, you should be wearing a mask and uh, even gloves and all this, and this cloud will probably let, go over and land on my cars, but all for the name of a Hackaday video, right? So what I've got is Satin Black Chip Guard by Sim. Let's see if we can get it in the light. Again, Sim happens to make it. Chip Guard, you ever see that texture along the uh, running board of your car that's there kind of for chips of rocks to come off and it's kind of got a, a satin or velvet texture to it? And you can get satin and velvet texture paints. Um, you can get additives to paints or even a clear paint that you put down uh, for texture and then come over with an automotive paint or something. Um, this is all in one can. I just happen to choose black, satin black chip guard. So we're going to go ahead and give this a texture to hopefully uh, hide some of our our, our bigger uh, uh, divots in it. Can't stress how much shaking, you know, mixing is appropriate. Here I do get to use my gun. Uh, this way my finger doesn't get all covered with paint. And again, same thing. We're just going for light coats that overlap. So I'm not getting the best spray pattern out of it this time, but it is what it is. I'm sure I'll get enough by the time I've done it several times. All right, I'm going to let that dry. I got uh, where it missed shot the first time is just way too wet, so I, I do have to let that uh, boil off, let the organics come, volatile organics, VOC, uh, come out of there uh, so that I get a chance to put a dry coat. Most of the rest of it's all right. So I've decided to go with a sunken tweeter, so I, I could have done a ring earlier, or I can just use my trusty hole saw on the flat spot we made. Hole saw it is. Again, Throw away piece, I'm not even going to center it up and measure it. <laughs> I don't even know if this is the right size hole. All right, home stretch for a speaker pod. So I'll show you just a couple little finishing details. Uh, time to screw the speaker into the pod. Well, you can, uh, if you want to dress that up a little bit, you don't have to use regular Phillips screws. I use what's called a security head screw and it looks kind of cool. has a special bit. Let me show you under the other camera. Here's the head. It's got two holes in it and that fits our bit like this. So when, when we're done, when we're done we don't uh, have a Phillips head. Time for a speaker grill. I've been doing this a while. I have a box of speaker grills. Since they're pretty much standard size, I can pick what I want, form it to fit. I'm not even going to try very hard because this is a throwaway. Yeah, let's try this. And there's a finished speaker pod. Now, in real life, I'd probably make these silver. Uh, all right. In real life, I'd make these silver. I would probably disassemble this tweeter if I was really using it, and I would dye or, or spray the parts, the grill silver for, for the contrast. And um, Sam and these other companies do make dyes as well as paints. So sometimes you use a dye, especially in leather, on some of the plastics, uh, and then you prep it and it actually opens the pore of the plastic and it's not paint. It goes in there and colors the, the, the plastic and you don't have to worry about little flakes coming off your grill. So, but there's our uh, finished speaker pod, uh, minus about 20 hours of sanding, not that much, but the sanding I couldn't afford. And we did this, um, using you know some standoffs and some fabric as you saw me do uh, to create the shape. All right, I want to show you more fiberglassing. Why? Because I've already made a mess. It's already hot. I'm sweating my electrons off. So I'm going to show you some of the standard standard uh, some of the legacy, some of the regular ways to do fiberglassing you think of. For example, I've got a bin here. This could be like your rear tire, your, your spare tire wells. A lot of people like to remove the spare tire, put her subwoofer there. I did it. One day I broke down in the middle of a New Jersey road in the rain with no spare. Kind of undid my subwoofer a little bit. Or this could be like the side of in your trunk where you want to uh, mold a speaker to, or whatever you want, but in my case I'm just talking about speakers. To, to, the, to the car itself without damaging the car itself. So, so what I've done for starters is I've taken my green tape, there in the blue tape, I think. Uh, uh, this is what I've used, this is why I see everybody else use. Uh, it's the 3M, I'm sorry, yeah, the 3M Scotch green tape. And I've covered half of it. Now, 
This starts the protective barrier between what I want to uh, uh, fiberglass up against, uh, but it's just the start. It's still porous, so I'm going to then uh, do some other things. I've seen people where they go in with the wax and do the fiberglass next. I'm going to put another layer in there to uh, protect the car, if you think of this as like the side of a car and I'm doing a uh, um, subwoofer. Here's something I bet you can't do. All right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my regular old 3M uh, multi-purpose adhesive. I've put up uh, headliners with this and stuff. Now I'm going to take some aluminum foil and I'm going to uh, adhere the aluminum foil to the tape. So uh, uh, the tape when it comes off will protect your car from the adhesive, but this stuff is not porous. Fiberglass can't get through it, the resin. Fiberglass can't stick to it. You can try and make the aluminum foil flat. I always start with that as my goal, never achieve it. And in complex shapes, I end up with having to do multiple overlaps and even occasionally patching it. In this case, you see me spraying the foil itself to patch a hole. Again, this is our protection, especially if it's somebody else's car, right? So I've left a little green so we can see our layers. The underneath is tape and then aluminum foil taped down. Now I'm going to lay some fiberglass matting in here. Fiberglass matting, lots of different kinds and weights. And I'll tell you that when you go to do a freeform standing, I mean, this isn't quite freeform, you need a lot of fiberglass. You build it up a layer at a time. If you try and build a big old thick fat layer of crack and hair bear bubbles, it's time consuming process. So you do start with thicker weights. If you see, this is shreds of glass, all right? And what they do, fiberglass, right? So what they do uh, in production houses is they actually have a shredder gun that has the fiber mat coming to it and it's got chopper blades and it actually blows this, this stuff. See, it's getting all over me already. In real time, mixing it with, fiber, with the resin in the gun and in the air, actually in front of the gun, and, and deposits it. But we're going to do it the old fashioned way. I'm going to cut some pieces of this, lay it into this. Now I'll show you one thing. There are other materials that can make the process quicker. If you look, this is a polyester type -ish thing. It's got holes in it and stuff. I got this from Select Products six years ago. Don't know where to get it now, but I'm sure you can find it. Again, what you're looking for, some, some kind of matting uh, uh, compatible with polyester resin. So let's start this. Sometimes you can cut it. This stuff's coming apart by hand for me, so I'm going to tear me off some shreds. But I'm going to keep tearing it into smaller shreds to lay it into here. If you can see that, and I'm not doing a perfect job here. This is, again, I'm blowing through it for the sake of a video. But I've laid it in there. A lot of times you put the resin down first. I'm going to soak the resin through and I'll show you that. I now have little fiberglass hairs hanging off my glasses. And already I'm seeing the color change. It's going clear. I'm, maybe you can see it. Now, you got lots of these, right? Cheap old brushes. Buy them 50 cents each. I could sit here and dip this and dab in there and you keep doing it until you see no air bubbles. You stipple it. You, you just go after it and keep pushing the air bubbles out. Or you can have one of these. This has these little rulers and this thing's job is to push the air bubbles out. So if you can afford one of these, great. I have two sizes, can't find the other one. Uh, you can do it with this. Now since this is a captive container, I'm going to go ahead and pour the resin in and then spread it around. So what you're going to see is you're going to see me rollering the bubbles out of the matting and then adding more matting. I just keep adding more and more of this. I'm trying to get it actually stiff enough that I can take it out to show you when I'm done. Um, in real life, I'd be here the rest of the day and use this whole sheet, I think. All right, I'm going to let that set. There is a limit. Look, see, it's almost see-through, right? That's my first layer. But I've chased the bubbles out, which is important. If I kept just adding to this while all in one, uh, um, all, all in one batch, it wouldn't be as strong. You need to let it set up. This thing needs to go in acetone. All right, I gave it a little time to set up. As I said, you do this several times. But I've, I've peeled the aluminum foil back. There's still some stuck to it. But you can see a start of what would be a speaker box. Uh, or, or whatever it is you'd want to do. This, and, and more importantly, 
we've left if this was a car uh, uh, you know part of a car inside the trunk or something it's undamaged a little bit of I pull the tape off of the aluminum foil that got stuck but again there's our molded part of the recess so basic fiberglass pods whatever you want to do you can custom that doesn't have to be a speaker uh, pod like that and uh, you know various ones we've done so this was just basic fiberglassing to show you that you grab yourself a uh, uh, grab yourself a, a gallon of resin again I use fiberglasssite.com you can use whatever you want try and get fresh try not to get it from uh, a store shelf somewhere where it's who knows how old and uh, get some paint brushes that cleans up with acetone if you need to do that create modern works of art as I've said and, uh, and you know trip out on it so, Bill Heard from Hackaday. Hope to see you again when it's not near as hot. There will be a contest, see how many people find out how many, uh, how many people uh, notice how many times I changed my shirt while filming this. So, uh, till the next time, maybe I'll tell you why there's an oven in my garage. <laughs>